Okay, good morning and welcome to the fourth session of the Innovator Training Scheme webinar series. We've got a bit of a change of pace this session where we'll be reflecting on the value of teams and team science approaches and how these can help create impact in translational research. The session is hosted by Ruth Norris, Head of Digital Strategy in Manchester BRC and lead for the Team Science Network in Manchester. Again, it's an interactive session. We've got a bit of a longer breakout session planned, about 20, 25 minutes, followed by some invited talks to demonstrate the value of team science approaches. Before we start a bit of session etiquette, please keep your mic on mute unless you're speaking. Use the chat or raise your virtual hand to ask questions. We always want to hear those. The breakout session is all about sharing your experiences. Remember, it's a safe place to learn from each other. So we encourage you to interact and use your camera if you have one, please. We start the session with an overview of team science. There is no I in teams. Over to you, Ruth. Thank you very much, Colette. So I'm sorry to buck the trend straight off the bat and not use my camera. I'm having some network issues at home today. So I am relying on my esteemed colleague, Ali, Ali to click through some of these slides for us. Um, and um, I apologize if there's any break in the connection. So again, thanks Colette, it's a pleasure to be here today and talk with you all. Um, my name is Ruth Norris, I'm Head of Digital Strategy at the Manchester Biomedical Research Centre and a Programme Manager in the Centre for Health Informatics. Um, next slide please, Ellie. So threefold presentation today, um, we're going to look at some nice def definitions and what is team science. We're going to look at what team science is happening at Manchester and um, also how to build successful teams for successful research. Thanks, Ali. What we'll also have uh, to get us through yet another Zoom PowerPoint presentation is a bit of a theme to keep you going. Next slide, please. So a traditional research group, if you do a couple of clicks, Ali, you'll see the structure come up. So what team science isn't, is a siloed hierarchical single, single discipline um, focus on upward trajectory, which often we see in, in, in structures. And it's usually some an esteemed person at the top who has a number of people who feed in their knowledge from their particular specific discipline who feed up. And then under them, your PhD students and researchers who again filter up their knowledge and all about creating this upward dynamic. Thanks, Ali. So that's what it isn't. Um, and this is what it is, certainly what it is in the Centre for Health Informatics. Here you can see those people on the previous slide are part of the party, but they're only one of the six modules. So you've got the academic and research, absolutely, really incredibly important, obviously. However, you've also got a, a whole plethora of different people who and different roles that make something happen so in health informatics in order to be successful it is by its very nature multidisciplinary so you know we, we, we're there are informaticians working with health scientists and doctors and um, clinics uh, clinicians etc to make something happen so you really need a model like this to really make it successful so we've made it flat multidisciplinary involving all stakeholders and recognizing the individual's contribution. So we've got skill specialists like software engineers, infrastructure managers, facility managers, all those people that keep the lights on actually make things work. Operations and strategy who actually make things happen. So uh, pro project managers, relationship managers, uh, strategic partner management, um, and then students and early career researchers are other stakeholders which will flex on every single project, but generally will include government industry funders. And then at the heart of everything is really the citizen in, in health research and health informatics research and data, use of people's data. Public trust is absolutely paramount um, and it's important in, in all research. So we think that that trust, that relationship, that co production is really key. Thanks, Ali. So a nice couple of definitions. No presentation is, is full without one. So I like both of these. The first is more broad and then the second is really quite specific, really, and nice for, for this kind of translational research. So firstly, a collaborative effort 
that leverages strengths and expertise of professionals trained in, trained in different fields. And then the second, working together to combine or integrate perspectives to accelerate scientific innovation in the translation of scientific findings into effective policies and practice. And I really like that one. And it reminds us why we all want to use this. Thanks, Ali. So there's really an, a real opportunity at the moment for Manchester to shine in its team science output. There's um, definitely a drive towards a focus and recognition of the model recently. Um, if you want to click through, there's a bunch of um, examples here um, that that I've that I've collated from the Wellcome Trust, from the MRC, from UK Research Innovation, um, all um, from Cancer Research UK all talking about in the last couple of years team science solving wicked problems how, how do you how do you work collaboratively starting to award for particular studies that can only work if you um, are cross-disciplinary which is something that um, we, people have had to work on a bit more recently um, if you keep clicking Ali and um, that one's um, about REF delighted to see that the um, university uh, return on, re on research output starting to recognize interdisciplinary um, as, a, as a variable in what they what, what they want to see in returns and a couple more clicks so there was a fantastic blog by the chief executive of UK research and innovation earlier this year which got a lot of a lot of activity so she talked about in the blog and I recommend reading it um, all the different people that I needed to make research happen and trying to debunk the myth of the lone genius being what research is all about and how things are found out. It isn't that. There's lots and lots of people working in research and it's how, how do we make sure those people are recognised um, and their progression and succession is there so that we keep those wonderful minds working on these things. So next slide, thank, oh, sorry, next click. Um, as, off the back of that, they. Um, they launched an activity to recognise these people and the diversity of opportunities and roles um, and career paths uh, beyond researchers and academics in, in a very sort of traditional angle um, and highlight these. So they, ha they had a really huge response to this. Um, one of those, there are a few from the university that I know about, but I, I nominated some people involved in the team science group in, in Manchester. And I'm really delighted that um, a member of my team, Benjamin Green, has been chosen to be included in, in, in this 101 um, case studies of, of different people working in the, in the field. Um, ben is a um, nurse by training, his first training. He then moved into soft, being a software engineer, and that's the capacity in which he, he works at the university. And in his spare time, he develops games. He, he has his own game that he's developed. And um, all of those things, because we use a team science um, experimental sort of model in our group, all of those have been brought together and some of the outputs that he's created have brought all those things together. And that's what, you know, that, that's why he's going to be recognised. So look out for that. We'll, we'll tweet about that when it goes up. Thanks, Ali. So a couple of examples here of team science. Um, my colleague Rachel Chown will talk about the cancer team science um, work in after the break. Um, we've in our group one of the sort of standout pieces is some work on supporting people with um, mental health difficulties, and um, we worked with Sandra Bucci to create an app to support people with um, early psychosis, and that was a very much a team science model. Thanks, Ali. And this is an example of where um, some project managers, so not um, academics, have put together a poster all about how they nurture and manage <clears throat> team science um, at the Ca uh, Cancer Research Centre and how um, the project managers add value. And then there's some nice um, academic champions talking about why pro project management is integral to research there. Thanks, Ali. Um, so team science at Manchester, really important that we um, 
use our use our knowledge now to to drive team science and I and some other uh, we're really just volunteers but we advocate team science and have been using it to an extent so we've been trying to drive um, Manchester's profile um, we've been to a couple of conferences in the US which were we're delighted to, to have been funded by the uni to, to attend. We're all PS, we're not academic, we're not researchers, but we went and we gave um, six presentations, a workshop, and we won two prizes, one of which they designed for us because they realised that they didn't have a, at the team science conference, they didn't have a, a prize for best team and they rec recognised that in us and, and awarded that to us. So we're trying to use this profile to really drive Manchester's um, impact in the world. Thanks, Ali. So um, I just want to talk a bit about some of the things that we think that team, um, team, team design is based upon to, be, to, to support successful research. So next slide. So first of all, it's about diversity. So we all love Harry. We think he's an excellent leader, um, but many Harrys do not a project, project team make. So if you just click through um, three or four times, you'll see it's not about him, it's about everybody. People that see, see things differently, people that work differently, people you wouldn't expect but will bring something to the table at different times. And if you bring all of them together, that's when you get a team that can really deliver. And that's how you create something really special. So that's why we're gonna do the workshop that we're doing after this um, and why we recognize the importance of, of everybody in, in a team. Thanks, Ali. Let's get through that, thanks. Um, yeah, so location. Well, things are a little bit different, so I don't really know what to say about this slide these days because we are doing things differently. But when we are working together in real life, it's we have found that it's really important to locate people together and that what you get out of that, it can be a massive, um, a massive value. And serendipitous meetings can happen if you have a computer scientist sat next to a GP, sat next to a statistician, sat next to a project manager. Uh, you get really organic things happening between people that you can't predict. Um, and I think Rachel will mention a bit about this and, and the new build at the Manchester Cancer Research Centre in the Christie and how they're, they're trying to build this into their model there. Thank you. Um, and then, and click again. So it's all about nurturing potential. So that's our second of the quadrant. So when those three 11 year olds turned up at Hogwarts, no one expected that they would save the world. And they didn't expect to do that. And there was their role as it were, but seeing the value and abilities of a person and using them to the maximum, rather than seeing the role, you can really develop what they could become so coaching mentoring giving people space and encouragement um, is really important and then we can all become you know reach our potential thanks Ali and to click again um, so talent this links in with that but the idea here is trying to create some blurriness around people's roles so rather than pe seeing people as an academic or a a software engineer or I don't know whatever it might be that we like to put people into boxes in their roles giving people this the space to try something out so um, have PS people doing some teaching have ha have some researchers doing some public engagement and these are real examples these are things we really do in our group we also and as I mentioned earlier Ben has created something called um, a mega game which is a, a real life simulation of a hospital system um, that's been run a few times with huge, uh, hugely positive um, feedback um, and a tabletop engagement game for um, working with the public. And both of those things have been um, off the side because we've given him room to experiment and try things out and add value through his experience, not his job role, what's written in his job spec, but what he can bring. Thanks, Sally. Um, and then again and then click a couple of times, perfect. Um, so this is some reading and some so that I would recommend if you're interested. There's a, couple of, there's a book here, which is a brilliant book. You can get it free on a PDF. And there's a report from the Academy of Medical Sciences who are really important in the UK in this space. Um, there's also a, recently a piece came out from the um, University 
staff training, uh, the wisdom of teams, really interesting piece of work. Um, I recommend reading that. Um, so that, yeah, next slide, thank you. So, so that's the end of my talk. I don't know where I'm up to time-wise. Um, nothing's working in my house, sorry. Um, but um, pivoting on to our, um, our activity then, I just thought it'd be really nice to spend some time talking about the diversity that's in this, in this room and reflecting on that um, for a couple of reasons. So firstly, because it will be a really nice way of getting to know one another better and building your network a bit more and you know, seeing people beyond their job title will help with that. But also it just demonstrates how people's journeys and people's um, um, can bring a lot more to a particular role. So um, you'll see diversity across the group, but also in the people, in their backgrounds, I hope. Um, so if I start off, um, I'll do an example of, from me, and then you're going to your groups with your facilitators and just share a bit of your experience um, and what you know about team science um, and, and, and kind of just drive a bit of a nice conversation between people. So from my point of view, um, I did an undergraduate degree in cognitive science, which is a, a science BSc um, in London um, a number of years ago. Um, and after that, I did a master's degree, which made me move to Manchester. And that's the reason I'm here in information management, which I really enjoyed, but I wasn't sure that I wanted to commit my life to that particular area, but it was a really enjoyable, diverse MSc. Um, I wanted to stay in Manchester, so I found a job working at entry level in financial services um, and I worked my way up there and my skills kind of came to the fore, which were probably sort of organisation, relationships, networking um, and analysis. So I, I became a business analyst, then a business and systems analyst for a financial company, and then I moved to another um, global um, financial services company as a business change manager and working on really large transformational programs. Uh, but I really was, I did this for years and I was pretty successful, but it, I really wasn't driven by the sector. It really wasn't, it wasn't my place. Um, and a friend of mine mentioned a job coming up in business development at the University of Manchester, developing um, health technology um, uh, partnerships across industry and the, and the university. And I went to, went for it, I got it. There was a whole new language, a whole new world for me. I didn't even know what a PI was. Um, I didn't know anything, but I definitely found my people. I've been here since 2012 now, and I've worked up from this business development manager role to program manager, um, a head, head of strategic partnerships and relationships in, in a couple of different roles. And, um, and now I'm here and um, team science and research is, it means an awful lot to me and, and I'm really passionate about it. So that, that's, that's where I am now. Um, so I think James is gonna put us into rooms with, you've all got a fantastic facilitator um, to chat through this with you. Um, and then we'll come back and have a few minutes to reflect together as a group. So Ruth, that should be everyone back in the rooms now. Um, I don't know if you felt that that was enough time or if you need, needed a bit more. Um, I, I can just pick up on that. We, so we, we hadn't quite managed to get around everyone in our group. So maybe next time we could do it for a tiny bit longer. I think, you know, everyone's got some really interesting stories and it, it was really it was really good for me to hear people coming from diverse backgrounds and, and willing to share their experience with, the, with each other. Um, so I think we, we just decided we could have a few minutes now to get some feedback from the breakout rooms of, you know, the kind of things that we were hearing about the use of team science approaches in, in people's research. Um, I'll, I'll just start off from that. Um, we feel like team science has been embedded within a lot of research, but perhaps at the moment in the pandemic, networking and building those networks to try and um, bring more diversity into your into your teams and interdisciplinary working has been quite difficult um, and that perhaps that within science in particular there's a little bit of a a conflict between the need to progress your career 
and ownership of your research versus you know um, prioritizing the team approach and making more impact for for your research and finally that while team science might be embedded with quite a lot of the research that we see in Manchester, that there are some groups of staff that maybe don't get the credit that they need. So professional service staff in particular, while they're valued, um, they don't always get the credit for the work that they're, they're doing. Um, so that was that was just what I heard in my room, but I'd be, I'd be really happy to hear what other people's heard in their room. Uh, does anyone else want to feed back? Yeah, I can go next. Um, we Thanks, had a really good, good discussion. Um, we did get around everyone and thank you all for your input as well. It was really interesting. You've all done so much and kind of traveled all over, whether you're from the UK or not, you now work in Manchester, it sounds like. Um, and quite a few of you did, did um, came to uni here or Erasmus and then went away and then came back to Manchester. So that's really nice as well. Um, some key takeaways. People are um, doing lots of team science and whether they knew it or not, um, it's really nice to hear. Um, and they're kind of acknowledging all the different groups that they work with, whether, whether it's internal or external stakeholders. Um, I think it's really important to identify who we work with and is there anyone else as well, kind of looking at those different groups. And um, a couple of key points was similar to what you just said, Colette, um, about being kind of like first author on um, publications etc and kind of that conflict of teams and how to manage that so maybe some thoughts or tips Ruth or anyone else if you've got any advice around that and um, again kind of costing in that team science approach and project management support and um, it might not always be costed in um, with the team science ethos but actually, I know the, the value is there but we do need that costing in projects as well. Great, thanks, Jane. Um, did any of the other facilitators have anything they wanted to feedback from their breakout room? Yeah, I'll, I'll feedback if that's okay. Great, yeah, thanks, so, Claire. Um, yeah, really great group. We we almost got around everybody, but we were just a bit rushed on the last person at the end, so I'm really really sorry about that. Um, but it was really interesting. Again, sort of the people's backgrounds and journeys, really diverse um, set of people that um, had sort of. Some had started out in academia a bit like my, myself and then realised that their skill set in organisation and, and other areas sort of lent more to kind of a project programme management. So sort of moved out of that kind of pure research area, um, but wanted to still be involved in central to the to the research, which obviously is what um, team science approaches are all about. Again, lots of people involved in team science, but maybe not necessarily um called it that and I think we we had a bit of a discussion about sort of how to get everybody from different disciplines communicating and speaking the same language um using a team science approach so making sure that you know when we use a particular term um everybody has that shared understanding of of what that means um and also had a conversation about how to sort of in the university and wider sort of in the local NHS trusts, how to actually get in contact with people from different disciplines and sort of expand your network and maybe if there's any tips um, on how people could do that, that would be really useful as well. That's interesting, Claire. We had a very similar conversation in our, in our session as well. In, in particular, you know, lots of people who might be starting out in their career at the moment in the middle of the pandemic is quite difficult to build those networks. The traditional routes perhaps aren't there anymore. And maybe we need to start thinking as leaders how we can help develop that in our younger researchers, maybe. Yeah, yeah, that's really important. Fantastic. OK, so I think now we have a presentation from Ali. So that you know it quite nicely leads on to Ali's presentation um he's going to talk to you about Translation Manchester and the networks he's been building to help support research of translational research over to you Ali thanks Colette let me just uh, try to share my screen is um is that visible to everyone yeah Yeah, is we it? can see that, yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Uh, so thanks for, for the introduction. My name is Alessandro, some of you might know me. I'm a translation research manager uh, based in the FBMH. And uh, after the uh, introduction that we had from uh, Ruth on uh, team science and the activity, I was just wanted to focus a little bit more in the next five minutes or so on how 
that is important on translation and innovation in particular. So as you know, I presented this slide in the launch event of this, uh, of this uh, scheme. Translation is the process of um, uh, translating basic discoveries into real life impact on patients and healthcare. And generally, this is how a translation are, um, an innovation goes to the translational pathway. So it starts from discovery sciences and then it reaches a disease focus and you get proper concepts. So those are the stages of discovery science, which we call translatable research. And then it goes on to, uh, to the implementation stage in the clinical translational research until it gets, the innovation might get adopted into, uh, uh, into the healthcare. Obviously, this is a model. And as I also uh, mentioned before, this is more how it looks like. So you can get uh, innovation that goes straightforward. A lot of them will have uh, side steps. Some of them will go back. And the, uh, in, in the, um, the, our role at Translation Manchester is to help doing that navigation of the, uh, the ecosystem in order for you to not get lost in translation. And the value of the network and team science is key to that. And I hope in the next couple of slides, I will be able to, uh, I will be able to demonstrate that to you. An interesting fact, uh, you know, we're called Translation Manchester and very often in our inbox, we get uh, the odd request of language translation or, you know, like we, we get a um, freelance translator coming to us asking if they can work for us, which is quite amusing. But actually, if you think about it, an innovator is technically a translator, especially in the early stages of translation, when a multidisciplinary team uh, gathers together, you can have uh, people from different backgrounds that try to uh, you know, solve the same issue, and, uh, but they don't really understand each other uh, because their uh, background is so different. So what, what, I, what I found, especially in my experience, is if you get one person within your team that is at the interface of those disciplines, uh, you know, think about um, a cell biologist and a material engineer. If you get a member in your team that can be a PhD student, that was in PhD student in my case, that can speak both languages, then I think that's the first step that will help you to unlock that project and uh, really translate in order to, to innovate. So I thought I shared that uh, fact that was uh, successful for us in, our, in, my, in my previous academic uh, experience. So, and how the team science can specifically enhance translational science. So this is a bit of theory behind it. I found it in this uh, science translational manager uh, medicine paper. The innovation can be divided in three stages. Variation, which is when the ideas come up, um, come up within the team. And selection, when those ideas come to fruition, you know, there can be a breakthrough, there can be a failure. And retention, when finally the innovation gets into the into, into healthcare practice and uh, needs to be retained and make an impact. So at all of these stages, having a diverse team, a multidisciplinary team can really uh, make the difference. Obviously you can have a, a wider range of ideas rather than you know, an individual which is limited to his own ideas. And then at the selection stage, you, you increase the chances of breakthrough and decrease the chances of failure because each single member of that team will have had experience in his own uh, research that uh, will, will help them predict uh, what bottlenecks can, can, can come up in the project. And at the end, in the retention stage, the fact that you have a diverse team with multiple people involved, each one, each of their own, having their own network will really um, facilitate the implementation and the retention of that innovation into the clinical practice. And in a similar way, uh, also, <clears throat> we, uh, if you have a team which share a mindset, so people with the same background, the same experience, you can still uh, have innovation, which we call incremental. So it goes from one step to another as a sequential thinking, but you will never have that radical innovation that comes when you have people with different backgrounds that interact with each other, uh, obviously led by uh, a PI, and that is called connective thinking, and we think is the key uh, to innovation, especially in translational science. So having said that, I thought I'd give you a little bit of an overview of my personal experience as a translational scientist, and uh, that will lead quite nicely into the next session, which will be a more in-depth um, overview on how uh, team science acts in translation. So I was lucky enough to be part of a, a research group here at the university led by, uh, by Adam Reed, uh, which was involved in the de development of a medical device that was then used in a phase one uh, clinical trial to repair, repair nerve injury. 
when I started in that team, I was uh, I was a postdoc, and uh, I thought it was you know just like your um, your other traditional research project. And that was, you know, led by the research team, delivered by the research team, and you know, you got publication at the end of it, or so on. And uh, I was very wrong because soon after the project started, I realized that there is so much more to it than just the research group that delivered the project. If this has to have an impact into the into the patient, and uh, we use this um, uh, this little cartoon here of the simple. Sometimes you know, people might know about the research team, but they might know. Who is that behind the scene that really makes it happen, especially in translation? So we soon realized that we had to interact with the funders. Uh, we were funded by NIHR, and I think during the duration of the trial, we had about three different program managers to to interact with. The university was the sponsor of the of the of the trial, so we had to interact and work closely with the research governance, the contracts team, obviously the tech transfer office because this was a medical device protected by P within the university, so that was UMIP, now is Innovation Factory, and um, obviously the trust because that's where the um, um, trial was delivered. So there is a trial man, there was a trial manager, uh, research and development was involved. There was a lot of steering groups and data, data monitoring committee involved in the delivery of the trial. I was less involved in the clinical aspect of it. I was more into, into the clinical um, work. In fact, I did interact with the clean rooms because that's when the where the device was manufactured within the, within the university. Mm -hmm. And again, we had a regulatory advisor. We spoke several times with MHRA to get the regulatory approval. We had an independent consultant. We had to uh, commission a toxicology review, all things that are not normally part of a, a research project and of an academic expertise, but you get that exposure and, uh, and it's fantastic when everything comes together and the different expertise uh, uh, can, uh, can lead to impact on patients. There was also some unexpected expertise that we had to develop, we never thought about packaging of a medical device, how to sterilize it, how the packaging affect the sterilization. So those are all aspects that were not even planned in the original uh, grant application. And uh, by the end of the day to deliver the trial, we had to develop uh, experience in. And obviously all the clinical trial um, uh, delivery uh, units within, the, within the, uh, the university and the trust. So that was my uh, really short overview of an example of translational team science. And uh, where do you start? So I think this was mentioned, mentioned in the, in the in the Q&A session just now, uh, what do you do if you're new to the university and you don't know what's available to you, what type of support you can get? So that's what Translation Manchester does really. If you are in, um, in need of an expertise, just like in the slide before, many of these people are actually in the slide in, the, in our network, you just come to us or read our booklet. This is a collation of partners, over 60 partners, all supporting translation within the university and the trust that can really help you at any stage with that expertise. So we suggest if you are new to the university and trying to find uh, collaborators or facilities that support translation, read that booklet or get in touch with us and we can do the signposting and matching for you uh, to successfully translate your innovation into the NHS. That's it for me. I hope I didn't go over time too much. And uh, I think I'll just stop sharing now so I can finally see your faces again. Uh, I hope that was useful. I think we have a five minutes uh, break now. And uh, after that, we can come back and ask any question to any of the speakers uh, that spoke before and you know, feedback and reflect on uh, our learning. Is that, is, that, is that it, Colette? Is that okay? It is, yeah. Apologies that my internet connection is really unstable. Yeah. So I'll just quickly say, if we have a quick break, um, come back in five minutes and then we've got two presenters uh, to really put it into life, team science approaches. Thanks. Okay, everyone. Hopefully we've got a lot of you back now um, and we can move on to our wonderful invited speakers. So we've got two great speakers. We've got Rachel Chan and she's from the uh, Cancer Project Managers Network and we'll present to you how they've been really using team science in that approach. And then we've got um, the director of the IMATCH program, uh, Fiona Thistlethwaite, who, who will present to us a really, you know, science, team science in action approach for a large project where they brought in lots of different partners to, to really help deliver a key research area. Uh, so Rachel, if you've got your slides, you should be able to share them now. Yeah, give me one second. No problem. Uh, 
Can you see that? Yeah, I can see that. Um, my internet, my internet connection is unstable. So, Ali, if if I don't if I don't pick up at the end of Rachel's talk, you know why? If you could take over, that'd be great. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Over to you, Rachel. Thanks very much for talking today. Okay, brilliant. No problem. So. Thanks for inviting me to talk. Um, as Ruth alluded to um, in her presentation, um, I've kind of been working on the team science front through my previous roles and my current roles and had, I had kind of a crossover with her and her team. So it's a pleasure to speak to you about team science and cancer specifically today. Um, so this first slide, I have to say these, this beautiful slide template is not mine. I've, I've borrowed it from my colleague, Joe, who I think is on the phone. So hence why these slides look so lovely. So. So yeah, my current role is Education and Development Manchester at the Manchester Cancer Research Centre, also known as the MCRC. Um, so we're a virtual organisation um, rather, rather than being a standalone institution. Um, founded in 2006 um, and our three main partners are the University of Manchester uh, Cancer Research UK as our main funder and then also the Christie NHS Foundation Trust. So um, that's our cancer specific trust in Manchester who I'm sure you're all aware of. Um, but that's not to say we're limited to those three. We also reach out to our other NHS trusts as well. So a um, lot of cancer work going on in Salford as well as MFT. So really we are designed as kind of an umbrella organization to kind of bring together all of the cancer research that's going on in Manchester. And hopefully by having that structure in place, it kind of enables um, multidisciplinary research, cross-working between the different organizations, um, as I'm sure, in some of you in similar setups will know that provides its own challenges in terms of the three institutions we've brought together. And um, they obviously have their own agendas and, the, and their own kind of ambitions. Um, but really this is MCRC as kind of enabling infrastructure um, in the main part. Oh, just gonna move forward, hopefully. Um, yeah, so um, kind of my boss and the director of the MCRC is Professor Robert Bristow. So, he joined us back in 2017 and I started at the MCRC about 10 days before that. So he's previously in Toronto and um, he's a prostate cancer expert and he wears a variety of different hats in Manchester. And um, he has a role at the university and the Christie um, and does a lot of work as well for CIUK, sits on their SEB. But essentially he leads uh, Manchester's cancer domain and is a real advocate for team science. So some of the exercises I'm gonna talk about today were very much his initiatives that um, he brought over when, when he started here in his role as director. Um, and I guess we discussed this briefly in our breakout session as well, but um, for me, it's really important, I guess, for our more traditional academic leaders to kind of advocate team science, advocate the utility in all of our different roles and really, really push that agenda forward. So he's a great exemplar of, of someone who has been doing this for the past few years in Manchester and, and has seen, we've seen some brilliant results in terms of what he's brought together. Um, sorry, my keyboard is not letting me move forward, but hopefully that's going to work. Yeah, so um, this is just kind of a bit of an overarching diagram of some of the groups um, that we, we would kind of class as, as those we can bring together in a kind of team science approach. Um, team science at the MCRC, a few bullets here about how we kind of want to build teams with complementary expertise. Um, we kind of look to collaborate to overcome some of those larger challenges just as kind of funders have starting, started to advocate, as, as we've seen through REF, there's, there's more recognition of that approach um, with the aim of kind of breaking down research silos and forging those longer term collaborations. Um, and I guess what I'd flag importantly here is that we very much see patients as a group that can input into that as well, um, which I'll go through in a minute. So um, the example I'm gonna to use today in terms of one of our team science approaches was our town hall initiative. So, we ran these um, back throughout 2017 and 2018. Um, and I'm hoping this is going to work. <laughs> um, so essentially um, this was done to kind of bring together some of those groups that I mentioned on the previous slide and um, to come up with like an innovative research idea. And I think this is going to let me show you a video. Please shout if it's not working for any reason. Oh, it's telling me my connection is unstable. Mm, okay, I don't think it likes it. That's fine. Um, I'll go back to my presentation. So there was a jazzy video that showed you all of these different groups coming together in one meeting, but I'm conscious of time. So I'll just talk to it instead. But as you can see, 
Um, there's some visuals here of when we kind of got everybody into the lecture theater and it was very much an open session and um, they were focused on a specific disease group. So I'm going to talk about the breast cancer town hall today. Um, but it was all about being interactive, about coming up with high ambition um, research project ideas. Anyone was able to come up with any of these ideas. It wasn't necessarily led by the senior clinicians, the senior academics. Um, we had all groups in there, including patient, patient reps and advocates, nurses, clinical trials coordinators, physicists, um, as I showed on the previous slide. Um, and there were, there were a few rules around the fact that it had to be unique. It had to be why would we do this in Manchester and not anywhere else? Because obviously we want to kind of um, play to our strengths. Um, and people were asked to come up with, you know, what would the headline be in a newspaper in three years time if we were successful in this research project? So um, I think this was quite an innovative approach. I was certainly wasn't aware of kind of this kind of research idea development being done in a similar way before. Um, I think people were Skepticals perhaps too far, but I guess they they hadn't kind of done it in this way before. But I think the sessions went really well um, in in practice. Uh, lots of smiling faces on the image I've chosen anyway. So <laughs> hopefully that's a true reflection. So in terms of the specifics of the breast cancer town hall, um, we went through the process that I just explained. We had um, sort of ten minutes at the start to talk about what we'd done in breast cancer so far, what were our strengths, what was our enabling infrastructure. And um, the, the town hall project that was chosen was this one that you see on the screen here, which was around reaching the unreached. So we identified the issue in terms of 80% of women who develop breast cancer under the age of 50 do not have a family history. So how are we gonna get out there in the community and make sure that these women are presenting and, and make sure that they're having mammograms at the right stage. Um, so various elements to this, there was this kind of psychology element in terms of making sure that we weren't um, kind of scaring those that didn't need to come in that we were capturing the right women to come and present um, that the way that they would ac access the tests was accessible so there was an element of developing an app so essentially a multidisciplinary team was required to do this um, this was obviously kind of in the early detection and prevention space um, and I think importantly we did have um, a patient in the room who had secondary mets from her breast cancer and she said you know this is a fantastic idea but kind of what are we doing for patients in this other space who are kind of at the, at the stage when they're kind of having metastases and as a result of that a secondary project was also taken forward looking at the in the met space so I just flagged that because I think had we not had that patient in the room and had we not had that voice then that secondary project wouldn't have been picked up so this approach of kind of bringing everyone together in the one room really can guide where we go and I think yeah it was just nice to see that that was really taken on board and, and pushed forward as well um, so those town hall meetings they did have um, a small pots of funding attached to them to develop the projects and um, so within the region of 100 to 150,000 per disease group um, which for this project in, in particular went towards the psychology PhD element which I, I mentioned and a research associate but I show this here as I think it's important to say that whilst we started out with that small pot of funding and it, it may be that funding is or isn't available when you're kind of doing these initiatives, actually that was a springboard on to do to kind of bring in a lot of further funding. And by the time we'd pulled the team together, they'd, they'd said, oh, well, if we wanted to do it at this level, we would also need this. And so we really knew where to look for further funding. So the CIC pot was available at the university at the time. So we kind of worked with that team on writing a grant for that which was also successful um, around the same time CIUK were developing their ACE alliance so international cancer early detection alliance and again we kind of had this team primed and ready to kind of feed into that um, and kind of have more kind of levered funding through pilot and project awards through that um, which which was fantastic so importantly all of our town halls had to have some sort of clinical significance um, in terms of the patients that we were we were targeting. So um, just here, I won't read this out word for word, but this is kind of the clinical impact end of things in terms of that project in particular, which has been running successfully. And as I showed on the previous slide, has, has levered in further funding. Um, so now I guess I'm gonna whiz through some more general team science points. So I just thought this one was really interesting to flag in terms of other initiatives that we have going on at the moment. So. Um, this is Natalie Cook from the Christie Hospital, who has recently been awarded um, a million pound grant from Innovate UK to kind of look into cancers of uh, 
unmet, unknown primary. Um, and she's collaborating with astronomers from the University of Durham. So I think I show this just to say it's not necessarily those traditional groups you may be thinking of that, you know, with team science, I think out of the box thinking is encouraged. And whilst cancer researchers and astronomers may not traditionally have been put together, you know, here they've, they've been successful in levering this funding in. Um, and as I understand it, we'll kind of be applying statistical methods that look at the ev evolution of the universe onto kind of the evolution of cancer treatment, which I guess, yeah, it just shows you that there is no kind of groups that we can't necessarily bring together to, to kind of do research. Um, I think Ruth has kind of touched on this already, but I guess just from a cancer sp specific perspective, I do think funders are becoming way more open and recognizing the importance of collaboration. Um, so myself and Fiona, our next speaker, we're, we're going off to interview for this PhD program you see at the top. Um, and traditionally, Welcome have only kind of funded medics, dentists, classic clinicians as part of those programs. But this year they've decided to open up to nurses, AHPs, other disciplines, and they will all be treated as one cohort. And I think that's from with my training hat on, that's really fantastic to see that it's kind of not hierarchical and we're, we're recognizing that it's just as important to train academic leaders in nursing, in AHPs, in others. Um, as well, CIUK, so I spent a couple of years working there and you know their biggest, largest um, partnership in terms of investment is with the NIH in, in the States to fund cancer grand challenges, um, which you know they've, they've branded as team science on a global scale. Um, and then just another example there from the MRC in terms of why we need team science. So, you know, three massive funders for us and all of them recognizing the importance of team science and, and the importance of interdisciplinary working. So my final couple of slides, um, again, Ruth alluded to the importance of location and co-location. So um, we are currently in the midst of our kind of rewrite cancer campaign um, in terms of the MCRC and the new build. So. Again, as, as I'm sure many of you are aware, back in April 2017, um, we suffered a fire at our research center uh, located in the Patterson building, um, which hold the, held the majority of um, kind of the CIUKMI research staff um, who are now down at Audley Park in Cheshire. Um, so that's come with its own challenges. You know, we're no longer collated across the road from the MI. We do have a shuttle bus system, but it's just not quite the same. So we're obviously delighted that um, the Rewrite Cancer uh, project and the, and the new build is on the way um, and here is a mock-up of it on the left hand side so in summary it should be even bigger even better it's you know designed with team science in mind a lot of the um, grants that we were writing to kind of pull funding in for this building we, we have to have our team science hat on and really make the argument as to why um, this will promote further collaboration and ultimately impact kind of the cancer research ideas that we come up with moving forward so um, this is due to complete at the end of 2022 with kind of full op occupation and use due in spring 2023, which is very exciting. Um, so I think that's my last slide. I will stop there. I hope that was all right on time. Um, I'm happy to take any questions or to come to those after Fiona's had a chance to present as well. Wonderful. Thank you, Rachel. I don't know if you can all hear me. I've moved to my phone, so um, I can't share my screen or put my camera on at the moment. Um, that was a really great talk. And I think it really does outline the, the, the true importance of bringing all of these teams together to really deliver for patients, especially in the town hall approach that you that you mentioned just now. You know, if, if we can all get our heads together and help prioritise what's best for the patient, I think that's 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 really, really, really important. Um, Okay, so we'll have some time for questions at the end, but maybe we should move on to Fiona now, if that's yeah. okay. Fiona, yeah, thank you, you thank you. Side? Yep, uh, I'll just share side. Thank you for asking me to speak. Let me just see if I can pull those up. Um, just to give you a heads up, we do have a bit of a hard stop. Um, as Rachel mentioned already, we're due to um, head down to for our Welcome Trust interview, and I have a train to catch, unfortunately, so uh, I'll, I'll whiz through. Um, okay, wonderful, can you see you. that? Yeah, can we you can see, see that? that? Yeah, yeah. And it's, I think it's not in presentation mode. Let me try that. But uh, right, have you got it there? Yes. Just let me know if there's any issues uh, with the sides progressing or anything. Okay, so I'm going to talk about iMatch, which is Innovate 
um, Manchester Advanced Therapy Centre Hub. And this is a real working example, I think, of team science and, and of pulling in multiple facets into a large project. And I can give you some hints and uh, things of some of the pitfalls, but some of the real pluses in doing such a large uh, project as this. So, um, uh, iMatch is all about advanced therapies. Advanced therapies are cell and gene and tissue engineered products. And they've really hit the headlines of the last few years with particular things like CAR T therapy, which has gone from quite early phase clinical trials right into the clinical setting now as part of our standard of care treatment and is being delivered in Manchester and elsewhere across the UK. Um, and it was back in about 2016 that the Manufacturing Task Force uh, did a report that said really the UK, as, as, as many times, has been at the forefront of developing some of the early technologies around these advanced therapies, um, but was in danger of slipping behind the US and China and others in that kind of embedding and, and really developing further. Um, and so they, but they felt it wasn't too late. The UK still had an opportunity to position itself as a global hub of activity. But the report recognised uh, the challenges around these are often bespoke to individual patients. There's issues around procurements of getting the tissue required for advanced therapies, manufacturing, delivery in the clinical setting. And it needed a coordinated approach to do that. Um, and so I'm actually... Hi, Sorry, can you hear me? Okay. Could you make it full screen just so we can see? Oh, it, it is full screen on my on my computer. I'm not oh. sure why it's it's not full screen for you. No problem. Um, if it doesn't work, we can send it after. Yeah, yeah. Um because it, it normally works. Are we on Zoom? It normally works just by doing that. Um Zoom is sharing. Is that not full screen for you? No, don't worry, we'll, we'll circulate. Okay, I think just in the interest of time, I better carry on. But can you see the slides progressing anyway? Yes. And I'll certainly make these available for everyone. Um, so Innovate UK, so it's a government funded body, uh, back in at the end of 2017, put out a call to, in recognition of that report to say we want some projects developing, large projects to form a national network. So this was really kind of forward thinking, saying we can't just do this in individual centres. It's like reinventing the wheel every time there's a new treatment that comes along. Um, and what they said was projects would start in 2018 and initially it was to complete by 2021 um, and that there would be some additional funding for network once the network had been formed to fund some network projects. Now they didn't make it easy, especially from in Manchester, we were really from a standing start. We had a good historical kind of um, uh, base, but not really coordinated up. So we'd run some of these early trials, there was pockets of activity. But what Innovate UK said was that actually we want you to form a consortium. There must be at least one clinical and one academic centre, one SME, so small or medium enterprise, one company involved in developing commercial advanced therapies, ATMPs, and at least one supply chain company. So doing the logistics of transfer from manufacturing site to clinical site. Um, and uh, there needed to be at least three organisations in total. And the academic research organisations could only claim a maximum of 50% of the grant. So that really kind of forced us to pull in across a number of different organisations, including clinical, academic, and the commercial partners. And we literally had, well, it was less than three weeks to pull this together, so I'm still not quite sure how we did that in terms of the deadlines. Um, but actually, sometimes it just goes to show that when you have a very tight deadline, if you're able to drop everything else and focus on one thing, you can really focus minds. And I think that's what happened in this case with, with iMatch, because we successfully pulled together a consortium. Um, involving two of the main trusts in Manchester around uh, cancer for the Christie, but more broadly uh, with Manchester University Foundation Trust. We obviously had the University of Manchester uh, incorporating uh, Manchester Cancer Research Centre and the CRUKMI. Um, and then below that, you can see here our commercial partners. And there isn't time to go into these individual, individually, but they, they came out of things like a university spin-out company um, in Instill Bio. Cytiva was the logistics um, expert, included AstraZeneca as a big pharmaceutical company, but really linking in closely with their digital experimental cancer medicine team and a range of other commercial partners. Um, 
And together we developed a programme. The iMatch programme and the Innovate UK funding wasn't purely about research, and that was a key factor. It was about scaling up activity to enable the pull through of, of uh, novel technologies, including both uh, new research, but also translational work. And so the programme that we developed centred around coordination of patient samples, processing and storage, electronic track and trace solutions for getting the samples from the patient to the manufacturer and back again, delivering increased infrastructure so that we could do that scale up piece within Manchester. And as you scale up, you clearly need to pull through education and training as, as a key part of that if you're going to train the next um, generation of people to deliver these therapies. Uh, and scale up in the clinical setting. So we were successful. We became one of three centres across the UK and, as I say, coordinated by the Cell and Gene Therapy Catapult. So the three centres were Northern Alliance, uh, ourselves, IMATCH and Midland and Wales. And the other two centres, Northern Alliance and Midland and Wales, are more geographically spread, with Manchester actually being focused around one city. And that was quite a nice way of doing it, actually, because um, we got both angles from the, from the um, uh, network of looking across wide regions, but also focused within one uh, city region as well. Um, and we've had Cell and Gene Therapy Catapult doing a great job actually coordinating. I think we're all a bit uncertain what role they would play, but they've been really the glue between the centres. And the network has built over the last three years um, to be really productive, collaborative, based around knowledge sharing as a key factor. And that's been maintained over those first three years. Um, across the Three centres, we have more than 30 partners actually, and over 200 people working on the programme. And um, London actually wasn't successful in their, their bid, but they had some separate funding for London Advanced Therapy, which is more focused on academic collaboration. And interestingly, as we move now from our original three years of funding towards, we have, uh, I'll talk about it a little bit more in a moment, some runway and extension funding. And um, we are looking to, um, it, um, to collaborate more with London, but also in, in, in our case, in that kind of scale up and pull through of translational research but London Advanced Therapies is looking to form a national network in the collaborative more discovery science and the two are really complementary so we're working very closely with them. So um, thinking about some of the aspects I'll probably just skip past this slide but it's available that's kind of the broad aims of the network um, but I just wanted to touch on some of the kind of challenges of running a big project like I'm actually we had almost nine million pounds worth of funding and um, pulling in so many different partners but some of the things that I think we just uh, worked well through was this idea of having work packages this figure is uh, the idea is this vein to vein theory for advanced therapies where you take a sample from a patient it goes to the manufacturer and then it's delivered back in the clinical setting and we built seven initially now eight work packages around that and one of the keys to making this really a team working was that different people led the different packages from we had so we had industry partners leading work package three and four we had um in work package two we had an uh, academic university partner and then in clinical clinicians leading the later work packages, work package five, and uh, going on to work package six. And actually across uh, multiple aspects of those work packages, we incorporated different people. So for example, work package six is led by one of our advanced nurse practitioners at the Christie site, as well as uh, Rob Wynn from the Pediatric Centre. So we were able to pull in across both different partners, but also uh, different um, uh, um, uh, practices and different um, from, from diff all, all walks of the academic and clinical uh, and commercial um, side of things. In, 2000, in 2020, we actually had an eighth work package, and this was around um, wearable technology and pulling in some of the work we'd done on translational work in um, toxicity management with cytokine analysis. And we'd planned to do that in the CAR-T setting, so in the advanced therapy setting. But actually, Innovate UK supported us to turn that into a COVID trial. And then they've given us some additional funding now to go on and run a similar uh, trial within the CAR-T setting. 
and that flexibility of Innovate UK has been enormously helpful, but also it speaks to that idea that if you build the team, you have a flexible approach to flexing when you need to and developing new ideas as you go along. And um, so we've got Cosmic 19, as I say, it's a trial of wearable technology in the COVID setting, which we're going to take back into the into the advanced therapy setting at a later time point. And that's pulled in again, um, intensive care specialists and, and broadened our, our team approach. And it wouldn't have been possible without that infrastructure already in place. Um, final few slides is just to flag up some of the successes of the network. Uh, we have really grown and one of the key things that it's led us to is an industry advisory group where we now have 67 partners uh, linking into the network, running some of their own work packages and work streams that we in Manchester can feed into. Um, and here's just a few of the partners, not just the industry partners, but the NHS partners that have linked together through that network project. I'm very conscious of time. And as I say, I'm happy to take other questions or perhaps email um, correspondence if you have further questions. But we now have with IMATCH, we got one year additional funding in the first instance, partly to allow a funded COVID extension and partly to develop some new runway projects. I mentioned right at the beginning there was some funding available in 2018 for some network projects and we lead here in Manchester something called Sample, which is 10 partners, some of them in IMAX, some new partners, looking at how we standardise sample collection in advanced therapies. And then, as I say, the ATTC network has really gone from strength to strength and we're now in detailed discussions around phase two funding beyond the extra year that we've, we've already secured. So this is something that grew very rapidly, but has actually formed a national network that's very cohesive and um, very collaborative, that's unique globally, really. I think we've, we've discussed with colleagues in Toronto and elsewhere around the strength of being able to work in this kind of team approach way. It takes particular individuals, I think. It has to be done as a team approach, otherwise it just wouldn't work. But um, I think hopefully that's provided you some idea of how this, how we can take the concepts of team science to actually deliver really quite big projects um, here in Manchester and beyond. So I'll, I'll stop there, I'll stop sharing. Um, hopefully uh, that's worked. Yep, and uh, happy to take just one or two quick questions before I dash off for my train. Oh, fantastic. Thank you, Fiona. That was a really wonderful talk. I think IMATCH is a really fantastic um, example where, you know, you can bring together all these different interdisciplinary teams and have mm -hmm. different diverse leadership helping drive a successful project. Um, yeah. and one of the things I meant to say actually and didn't was Innovate UK have been fantastic in many ways in their, their support and their flexibility. One of the things that filled us with fear right at the beginning of the project was that their reporting structure is that you have to report quarterly. So we have quarterly meetings with our monitoring officer and we can only claim funds retrospectively. So once we've had that quarterly meeting to then uh, claim what we back what we've spent. Um, so actually what that does, although that makes it really tough in terms of it, it's kind of constantly thinking about what are our deliverables, what are our milestones. In some ways, it's actually really helpful having that quite strong um, kind of push to make sure that yeah. we do that and that's actually um, uh, you know enforces that project and makes you stick to the deliverables and milestones and actually coming back to the the, the funder to say this is what we've achieved I think it ultimately is very helpful but yes. can be quite tough but uh, developing those really clear project plans and assigning tasks to people is really important yeah, I think that work package idea is a way, you know, it's a way that funders are coming around to, to looking at now that I worked on an EU project previously and it was very tough to do this quarterly financial reporting, but it did really make you stick to target and, and look at your work yeah. package deliverables and pull back if you don't think you can do that and maybe prioritise in different areas. And I think that's a really great way to work as a team as opposed mm -hmm. to working in silos. I think it's, yeah. I think it's something we could adopt across the board. Um, well, we have run over a little bit, and I know that Fiona and Rachel have both got to get mm -hmm. off to a very, very important train. Um, thank you for putting that for that in. Um, we, we could probably set you up on the team site that we're, we're developing, and if anyone's got any questions, then they can direct them to you, or we, we can field them and we can maybe, you know, facilitate in between the two. Um, unfortunately, I've lost my slides because I'm, I'm off my phone, so I can't share the final slide with you. Um, but we should probably wrap up because we are quite over time. 
I just wanted to let everyone know that um, we've got another course that we're running in parallel to this. It's the Researcher to Innovator um, program that is with the Masood Entrepreneurship Centre. Uh, and it's a, it's a two day boot camp on the 28th and 29th of June. Um, there's some places left. If anyone would like to register for that, we can perhaps put it in the chat. I don't know, Jane, if you can, um, or we can share it on the team site or via email. And the next session for this will be communicating your research to commercial audiences. And that will be on Tuesday, the 20th of July, 10 till 11.30. Um, if you've not registered for that yet, please do. It, it's going to be a really great one, pitching your idea. Um, and there'll be some mentoring and one-to-one -one sessions following that. Okay, um, I think that's it. I think we should wrap up. So just thanks to Ruth and everyone for today and uh, see you all next time. Bye-bye.